Okay, so, well, I guess when you get more senior, you don't have, you don't do, well, I shouldn't say you don't have to, but uh, dialysis access is not as sexy as aortic work, but for you guys, that's what you'll be doing, because you're gonna be real thirsty when you get out, and this is what you're gonna get. So, anyway, okay, so steel, not a fun topic. I actually, my patient, my last patient today in clinic had this, but um, a hard topic to deal with. Um, so clinical arterial insufficiency um, due to diversion of blood into access. So just because they have a palpable pulse does not mean that they can't have steel, okay? Um, uh, incidence is about one to 9%. Uh, usually you see it early on, right after you create your access, and um, a higher incidence in grafts and a higher incidence in females who are diabetics. Etiologies include um, an inflow stenosis of so some sort of um, aortic arch stenosis, uh, big vessel stenosis or axillary, uh, distal intrinsic disease. So many patients that you have will be diabetics and just like their feet, how they have microvascular disease, the same thing can happen with the hand and they may not feel it, but then you put an access in and that's when you'll start to see ulcers and um, tissue loss. And then again, high flow fistulas can cause this. And usually, um, if it's um, mildly symptomatic, they'll say, well, it, oh, I hurt after dialysis and not all the time. Um, so when they come to your clinic, um, in order, the first thing to do is try to prevent steel, knowing the risk factors. You want to ask them ahead of time, okay, numbness, tingling in your hand, any previous accesses, did you have steel symptoms? Perform your Allen's test, like I said before, do a good pulse exam, check bilateral blood pressures, uh, get a duplex, and then angiogram if you feel like there's some sort of inflow disease first. Um, the risk factors include, um, again, if it's a graft, they're female, diabetics, or pre-existing PAD. Um, so the symptoms and signs, it's a range. So there's a scale from uh, zero to three. So first, like I said, pain, numbness, some tingling during dialysis, all the way to tissue loss. Um, and again, you can check this for yourself in clinic by checking their pulse and then um, compressing the fistula and seeing if their distal pulse gets stronger. This is the SVS reporting standard, so zero to three, three being the most severe. And again, you can get sued for this. So if you leave a patient with tissue loss and don't take care of it, um, they can sue you. Um, the test that you wanna get if they present with steel, having done all the preventative measures that you can, so again, get the, a duplex of your official or graft, make sure your volume flows are not high, so over two liters I would consider high. Um, look at their arteries and the direction of the flow, so if they have retrograde flow on their duplex of their brachial or radial, that kinda tells you it, it really is stealing. And then a steel study, which consists of PPG uh, digit waveforms and pressure, so um, how your um, waveforms are responding um, on how, when you uh, compress the fistula. And then in many patients, actually, I also get an EMG because what I found is um, many of them have carpal tunnel syndrome, which is worsened with dialysis. So um, 50 to 70% of, of patients um, on long-term dialysis will have some sort of uh, neuropathy in their hands. Um, here's some images of a steel study. So as you can see, this is retrograde flow on your ultrasound. And then with compression um, of the fistula, you'll see it going back to forward flow. Um, here's a normal steel study. So with compression and without kind of the same waveforms, here is a positive steel study. So with graph flow, there's just like nothing going to the third digit. And then you compress and you'll see flow back again. So increasing greater than 50% in velocity in the distal artery is per, uh, consistent with steel. Um, so what's your next step after this? Usually I do perform an angiogram because not only can you um, confirm your steel study, but you can confirm radiologic steel. So you'll see the um, dye just wash in. I mean, nothing gets to the hand. And also um, you can intervene if you need to. Right, so this is radiologic steel where you shoot your angiogram in your artery and nothing gets past the fistula because it all gets washed out. Um, this is an example of intrinsic disease uh, where you know everything else is okay, but the 
the access is actually causing um, clinical symptoms in this already very stenosomous occluded artery. And then uncommon, but can happen, um, you know, arch vessel stenosis. And if you find this, what I tend to do is I will fix this and see if they get better because this is usually enough for them. Um, so if they have acute rest pain or motor impairment right after the surgery, which, you know, sometimes it's difficult because most of the time they're, these are being done under regional blocks, right? So you kind of don't know because they go home and they, they're numb and then they have severe pain. But if they do, if the nurse calls you for motor impairment, even if you have pulses and uh, a warm hand, it could be IMN, so ischemic monomelic neuropathy, which you have to immediately ligate. And um, the reason why this happens, the thought process is that it's a steel syndrome of the nerve. So the nerve actually becomes ischemic before anything else. And so that's why they get these symptoms of severe numbness, weakness, pain, even though they may still have a palpable pulse. So this patient had this um, and the graft was ligated and removed. He needed actually fasciotomies, but eventually he recovered. Um, so management, um, you know, if they have rest pain or tissue loss, the board answer is to ligate. Or you will fail your boards if there's tissue loss and you don't ligate. Um, mild, moderate, you can watch them and see if they will improve. Most of them will improve over time. And then if you failed medical management, there are other options that you can um, discuss with the patient and procedures. So um, if it's a radiocephalic fistula, you can um, ligate the radial artery. This is actually a board question, an oral board question. Um, what would you do if you had steel in a radiocephalic AV fistula? But before you ligate the distal radial artery, what do you have to do? Huh? It's like, mm. yeah. Yes, yeah, so make sure you have an intact palmar arch. Good, y'all are alive right now. It, I know it's getting late. Um, so yeah, so make sure that it, there's an intact palmar arch before you ligate. Um, so different areas of disease, so if it's proximal disease, again, do your angiogram. Uh, you may be able to angioplasty, a proximal stenosis, bypass. Again, all options, all of these um, types of symptoms you can ligate if you need, if you absolutely need to worst case scenario distal disease you can do a drill proximalization rudy um, high flows you can decrease the flow by banding plication that um, i've done that a few times there are not many studies that show that it actually works so flow reduction procedures again banding um, many ways to do it uh, you can uh, place a dilator and uh, use 2O silk to kind of tie it off to make it tighter. You can actually make an incision and plicate it or even put a little band around it to make it tighter. Um, so uh, moving the arterial inflow to another source. Um, proximalization is one versus Rudy. I do more proximalizations actually than drills. Um, and Rudy, I've, I've never done, but proximization, the thought process is that by using a taper graft, so I usually use a four to seven, I move the inflow to a larger vessel. Um, so here's a brachiocephalic fistula. You tie this off, then you attach a um, taper graft. The seven millimeter would go here, the four would go here um, to the upper arm, and so that would be your inflow. So the thought is that your inflow um, is from higher up so that more blood flow will go to the actual hand. A Rudy, so this is using a smaller branch artery to provide flow so that you allow the other forearm vessel to supply um, the hand. Um, so you tie that off and then you do a graft to a distal artery. And then drill um, is uh, doing pretty much a bypass, but again, uh, you have to ligate. In order to even bill for this, you have to ligate the uh, brachial artery. So larger, more proximal artery gives you a better inflow source. And the thought is that it reverses the pressure sink, but in order for it to work, it has the bypass has to be seven to 10 centimeters above where your initial anastomosis is. And then again, ligate um, the brachial artery. So here's an example of a drill. Here's your fistula. And you do, uh, usually with saphenous veins, so you do have to put them to sleep. 
and you bypass distally and then you tie, it, tie off the brachial artery. Um, so axis steel, it's a bad problem. You actually will see it more often than you think you will. Um, and it's a tough talk with the patients because usually, you know, do they want to wait for, to see your full workup? They, they usually don't want to ligate their access because they know how important it is for them. Um, but at the same time, you don't want them to lose their hand or have any wound problems. Um, so the answer is not to bury your head in the sand. Um, and to do your full workup, you don't want this to happen. Um, so if there's early severe symptoms, pain, or sensory motor loss, you want to ligate. All, tissue loss, you definitely want to ligate. If it's mild, uh, where they say, oh, it's just, you know, after dialysis, I'm a little numb or tingling, I can, I can watch that. Um, and then fistula that with steel symptoms that occur delayed or late, do your complete workup and tailor it according to that patient's anatomy and what you find on your workup. That's it.